Our uh, next speaker is Dr. Doug Politz of the Norman Parathyroid Center in Tampa. Dr. Politz is a uh, fellow of the American College of Surgeons as well as a fellow of the American College of Endocrinology. He's uh, uh, also a member of the uh, Association of Endocrine Surgeons. Dr. Politz trained in surgery with Dr. Norman at USF in the 1990s and then moved to Austin, Texas, where he performed uh, the first radio-guided parathyroidectomy in Central Texas in 2000. He built an extensive uh, endocrine referral network throughout Texas prior to returning to Tampa and rejoining Dr. Norman at the Norman Parathyroid Center in 2006. He has performed over 7,500 parathyroidectomies and has devoted his career to advancing the understanding of parathyroid disease. Dr. Politz. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, all of you. Very much it an is honor a, to be here with you. Again, a great honor to be able to come and talk with you guys about an area of great passion. Obviously, I, I've devoted my career to this disease. Um, it is, a, uh, of course, an honor to work with Jim for as long as I have, dating back to residency. I will tell you, one of the fascinating things about working in a practice solely devoted to one disease is that you get to, you get the unique advantage of re-asking all of the basic questions that would come up in your mind. And it could, you could place yourself in the position of really any disease. If you could see a disease in the types of numbers that we see them, if I could accumulate 10,000 patients with a disease, I'd ask all those basic questions again and see, was I taught the right thing? Have, have I been learning this the correct way? Is that what the data bears out? And so one of the areas for me that has been a, a real fascination is to see the NIH criteria and then to ask all those questions of our database and our experience and see if the data bears out. A historical perspective, as we all know, I will, I'll run through this quickly as we're all very familiar with it. In 1964, the automated multiphasic biochemical screening device came out in California, like a lot of things. And as that came into common use, and you could not specifically order a calcium level, but order a panel and get sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium levels, obviously there was an exponential increase in the rate of diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism. The only known treatment at that time and the only known treatment now that is successful is parathyroidectomy. After a couple of decades of people like yourselves, practicing physicians, people on the front lines who are getting calcium levels back that are 10.2, 10.7, 10 10.3, and making the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism, it was very obvious that a lot of questions were coming up. What is the appropriate management here? Do I need to send to surgery every exhausted, depressed, crabby insomniac that comes to my office that has a calcium level of 10.4? Well, it was this groundswell that when you read a very interesting read, which is the actual published article from the initial NIH conference. When you read their inspiration for gathering, that's exactly it. There were lots of questions. Do all of these people need surgery? Can some of them be followed? Who are we going to call symptomatic? Is there a group that could safely be followed? And we don't call them symptomatic, we call them asymptomatic. So the consensus conference gathered in 1990, and there their first issue was to say, we're going to call symptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism the traditional symptoms. The things that they all have known all along since 1925, the stones and bones crowd. Kidney stones, renal dysfunction, osteoporosis, overt neuromuscular dysfunction, a prior, severe, uh, a prior episode of hypercalcemic crisis. This was pretty much an easy decision for them. As I said, a very interesting read is to read the actual published article from the Annals of Internal Medicine from 1991. 
because the way this has gone out into the practicing world and the way it's written to me is entirely it's entirely at odds in some sections of it. The things that are addressed as as I call them non-symptoms, the things that are what our patients come in and, and complain about. This is what brings them to the doctor. I'm tired. I can't sleep. I have bad short-term memory. My legs are crampy. I'm more irritable. The people at work can't stand me. My husband can't stand me. The, I, malaise, difficulty with concentration, bone pain, weakness, GERD, and that list goes on and on. The panel made it clear that this was not what they would call symptomatic or symptoms of primary hyperparathyroidism. This is a group of patients that would be labeled asymptomatic. I've lifted this from the actual article, and I think this is a very telling quote from that article from 1991. Our uncertainty about the natural history of asymptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism can be likened to the understanding of hypertension or hypercholesterolemia before large-scale epidemiologic and clinical studies were completed. They spell it out that they really don't know. They, are not, they don't have a large database on which to make ironclad dogmatic recommendations on who is to have surgery and who is to be observed. They actually say that I, another thing that I thought was fascinating as I uh, first read that article is there's a statement in their published article that says all patients with this disease are candidates for surgery. All patients with it, since there is only one known treatment, all patients should be considered candidates for surgery. There may be a group of patients who can safely be followed, but we simply don't know what the ramifications of decades of primary hyperparathyroidism ongoing would have on an individual. So I, I think that the, the hedging that the panel placed out there when they were being called upon to answer questions for practicing physicians to try and help practicing physicians I think some of that hedging comes out with this one statement. They also say the nonspecific nature of these symptoms is not sufficient for surgery unless it was perceived that these complaints were indeed related to hyperparathyroidism. Reading between the lines there, that's you guys decide. Okay? It's I, we're not saying that we're not saying you don't you can't send someone for surgery that, that has these other vague neurocognitive symptoms but we're just saying that you need to be convinced that that's why it is. Now as we ask ourselves about these symptoms and we graph these, we're gonna take each of these criteria together. I mean, uh, sorry, we're gonna take each of these criteria individually and stack it up against the database. One of the uh, recommendations of the NIH Consensus Conference was that they believed that as time went on, calcium levels would get higher in a patient that was going to actually develop end organ damage and that symptoms would develop in patients as time went by as their calcium went up. Well, when you look at our database of 10,000 patients here, so here we have number of symptoms here and blood calcium levels here. Some of these numbers are a little bit low I mean, uh, a little bit uh, small here, and I'm sorry for that, but this starts at normocalcemic hyperparathyroidism here and continues all the way out to extreme levels of hypercalcemia at 13 and a half and 14. As you see, the line goes down. The trend line is down. Average of around six symptoms per patient. And these, are, these include all those neurocognitive symptoms. These are all patients with primary hyperparathyroidism, and these are the things that they complain of. And as the serum calcium level marches upward, you actually see less, you see fewer symptoms that are described for the disease. 